So I've drilled the holes next to the track, making sure that I don't let the chuck hit the top of the track and damage it. And then I'm going to use um, these wires. This is um, just solid core mains cable. You can get this in B&Q, home base, wherever. And then I strip it out of its uh, sheath and end up with three types of wire. The thin wire is the earth wire, which is unsheathed. And then inside the grey outer is the two um, sheath wires, which is one is brown and one is blue. I've cut off all the insulation for those, so I've now got um, two lots of thicker wire that I'm going to use for the power loops and one load of thin wire that I'm using for the, um, the droppers on from the rails. So I've got here one of the wire droppers, the copper wire, and one end is attached into this uh, terminal block. The purpose of having that is it gives an ideal point to um, test any connections. As we know good soldering requires clean surfaces so I'm just going to brush the end of this dropper with this fiberglass pencil just to clean off any oxide, give a nice bare metal surface to work from. Same goes for the track. I'm just going to get in there with the, the end of this just to clean off any dirt or oxide in there. Make sure that's ready for the soldering. So if I now push that up from underneath, There's a bit of material on the top of the track, I think that's a bit of flux. I'm just going to take that off with the glass pencil, make sure it's a nice smooth surface there for the wheels. Yep, that's fine. We've got a minimal amount of solder, so that um, looks good to me. Ultimately that'll be ballasted up and not quite so obvious once that's done. For the odd location where the battens are in the way, I run wiring under the track to the other side, making sure to insulate it where it goes into the posing track. Here under the lifting section you can see how the wires leapfrog from dropper to dropper. You can also see why it was very useful to drill holes in the battens right at the very start of construction, which allows the wires to be guided around the track. The other way I'm securing cables is with these self-adhesive tie mounts that I got in tool station and some zip ties. They simply stick on the underside of the board and then the zip tie holds the cables together. I make sure that I don't pull the zip tie too tight. This then allows me to add more cables later and also if I need to cut the tie off to redo it or get to the cables I'm not going to be in danger of snipping into any cables. In places I've also used these plastic clips which simply screw into the battens and hold the wires in place. They're useful where I want to keep the underside of the board clear. In this location, it's right where the turntable's going. A lot of the um, power is supplied through this leapfrogging structure of wiring. Each board, north, east, south and west, has got its own cable, and they all end up coming back to this section here, which is above where the control board's going to be. And it's a bit of a jumble, so I've used tags to label the wiring. That particular coding means it is zone 2 from the south. It's a positive supply to the track. So others will be the one next to it, for example, is 6 plus T, so that's the zone 6 positive supply to the track. But zone 6 is a programming track and only in the uh, east section by the window, so there's no need for a, a location code. Where the wiring comes down to the control panels, I've used more zip ties to try and tidy up. Under the layer of this control section, power from the DC controller and the DCC controller go through this switching box. There's a DC input here, DCC positive this side, negative on the other side, they're just banana plugs. This is a DC power plug. There's six switches, 
on the top of the panel. As described in the previous video, the track is split up into zones. We've got the outer loop, inner loop, the tunnel, goods yard, TMD, and the programming track. So I can switch each zone on to DCC supply individually and each switch is a double pole, double throw switch which means it's isolating both the positive and the negative supply. The outer loop has the option of having DC supply to it when it's switched off which allows me to run in DC locos or have DC locos running on the track at the same time as DCC and when that's switched on it goes over to DCC supply. So this, the um, six individual power lines for positive and six for negative then go through a terminal block and into this board I've made up which has got six car bulbs on it. I'll explain what they do now. When there's a short circuit across the tracks what happens is there's a very high current flow because there's no loading and that's what the controller detects and cuts off the power. So when the short circuit protection kicks in, all the supplies of the track goes off and all the locomotives running will stop. Now for a small layout that's not probably an issue because generally short circuits occur when locos go through points. So you'll tell where the problem is because that loco will stop. Um, but all the others stop too so it can be confusing. For a large layout that's split up into zones, it makes sense to have short circuit protection for the individual zones. The way the car bowl protection works is that when there's a short circuit across the track the bulb lights up. Now normally a bulb that's cold has very low resistance and the power will just pass straight through it. But when there's a high current flowing it gets very hot and its resistance goes up massively. So now there's no current spike for the controller to see. And as you can watch on the display which is currently showing Loco Program 3 the DCT controller doesn't see the short, doesn't lock out, and everything keeps going. So when a loco stops and the bulb comes on, you know which zone the short circuits occurred in. And you can check the track and check the loco for a fault. So the reason the loco stops is that all the power is being drawn by the bulb there's no current flow going through the track and the locomotive. This method protects the chip in the loco from high current spikes but allows the rest of the layout to run and identify which area the short circuit has occurred in.